Good morning again, Real Life Church. Hey, I love, I love that at this point in the service we're wrestling to get your attention back. I love to be part of a church where we love to get to know each other and hang out with one another. How are we doing this morning? It's wonderful to be with you all. Hey, I just want to look right in the cameras and welcome everybody that's joining online. We are so happy that you're joining us today. Can we give our online friends a round of applause? Let them know that we see them. We love you guys. Also, I'm going to tee up at the end of the service, if you've never been with us for a real-life church service before, how we end our services is we take five minutes after the message to just sit and talk with the people around us over a couple of questions. We're going to ask questions like, what does this say about God? What does this say about us? What can we learn from this? How can I pray for you? What's our next step this week? So just know, as our speaker is up here today, be thinking about some of those things that you might want to process with the person next to you. A special thing about today, though, is after those five minutes of connect question time, we're going to put on a 10-minute timer, and 10 minutes after the service is done today, we have a real-life church town hall right here. Uh, Pastor Jim teed it up last week. We sent out a little message about some of the news in our church finances, and we just want to open up a town hall in case anybody has any questions. We're after that, um, after service is over, go get your kids. The town hall is going to be short, so if you you want to have them even with you during that, that's totally fine, but just wanted to uh, put that in your brain that something different is happening after the service today. But I am so excited to introduce our special guest speaker, Bill Tibbetts, this morning. Bill is a personal, very, very good friend of me and my family. Actually, his whole family is very close to our family, and we're so excited to get him up here and introduce him to you. Bill, a lot of us, uh, when we were at North Central, Bill was the the dean of the College of Business and Technology, and he has a heart and a passion for telling people, you are not just anything. Fill in that blank. You are not just a business person in the marketplace. Every single one of us has a calling to do ministry to the people around us, no matter what we do, no matter where we are. And I'm so excited to get him up front of everybody again today. Would you welcome my good friend, Bill Tibbetts. I love this guy. He, he, he looks post-beast transformation and Beauty and the Beast. You're the handsome prince. Uh, I like, doesn't he? Yes, I love that. Hey, for those of you who are joining us online, thank you for being with us today. And those who are here, my goodness, thank you for inviting us to celebrate the Lord with you. Pastor Jim and Beth, thank you. Thank you to the whole team. We're very, very excited to be here. I have a little bit of a practice. I was wondering if you could join me in this little practice before I preach, if you're okay. I'm going to have you do a motion. Now, I, I, I typically wear headsets, but I have what is called a Fred Flintstone head, and the headsets did not not fit. It's okay. You are allowed to laugh. I'm chunky. Uh, I, I'm fluffy, actually. I'm more fluffy than chunky. But uh, the headset didn't fit, so I can't use both my hands. So this is what I'd like you to do. Put both of your hands out like this, if you can. Okay? And we're going to do this until I'm a teacher, not a preacher, so I'll wait until everybody does it. <laughs> I'm waiting. There we go. Oh, there we Good job. I was waiting on you. All right. Good job. And then we're going to do this. Push out both hands. Okay, let's pull them back in, and we're going to push out, okay? Do this. Father God, we receive all that you have for us to receive today, and we give all that you need us to give today. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it crazy to think the Lord could have us anywhere in the world, but he has us here right now? Okay, when I walk through my day with that mindset, it absolutely transforms how I interact with everything in my day. We sing the song, everything is a purpose, Lord. Everything you do has purpose. You are here today. So let me ask that we can be open to receive and that we can be open to give all that we need to give. Sound good? We good? Yes, yes. I'm a teacher, not a preacher. So you ain't saying amen for me. You're saying yes for yourself. So yes. All right, here we go. I want to introduce my family before we get started. I'm not going to make them stand because I just got the look. Uh, 
First person. <laughs> well, let's pause. Poor me. I have friends that are here today who are just visiting just to, just to hear and make fun of me later on. I just want to thank my friends for being here. I, that tears me up. I love my friends. My friends are the best. But I want to introduce my family. First of all, this is my wife, Natalie. Natalie, you can just raise your hand. Natalie has been a pastor at our church for 16 years. And the last month, she made a transition. And now she is an adoption social worker. And isn't that incredible? I'm just really, we're really, really proud of her because that takes a lot of courage to step out of something into something new. That's a lot. So we're really, we're really proud of you. I'm going to jump down to my son. This is my son, Graham. Raise your hand. There we go. Don't call him Graham Cracker. He won't respond. Uh, But that's Graham. We love him. He's 13 and he's incredible. He's so smart. He's truly one of the funniest people I've ever met. And he bas- he doesn't smell bad. And I appreciate that. I genuinely, genuinely appreciate that. I've yet to smell him smell bad. Uh, and then this is my daughter, Ada. Ada, raise your head. Ada is in college at North Central where I was. And she's, she's studying marketing right now. Uh, you'll never meet a kinder person. Uh, she genuinely loves uh, with all of her heart. So it's a great privilege to be known by Ada Tibbetts. Now, next to Ada is a young man named Elijah. Everyone say hello, Elijah. There we go. That's Elijah's friend. All right. He's got one friend, but it's okay. The Lord said, don't be alone. The Lord gave him a friend. Uh, Elijah has deep integrity. He's very, very intentional. Um, And he also happens to be a friend that is a boy of my daughter. (laughs) He is a friend that's a boy. (laughs) Oh, Ada, Ada actually gave me something to read. Hold on one second. Yeah, she did. This is what she said. She said, uh, uh, Elijah is one of the kindest boys in the world. His heart to serve is an overflow of his relationship with Christ. His eyes are as blue as the ocean. They sparkle like the sun hitting the waves. I'm stopping there. All right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> She did not give that to me. Uh, (laughs) My wife was like, "Ah." (laughs) it's all good. Hey, uh, uh, as part of my wife transitioning from full-time pastoral, we've been blessed to travel to different churches around the Twin Cities and celebrate what the Lord is doing. And it's been awesome. And I want to tell you something. One of the things that we've discovered, this is off script a little bit. One of the things that we've discovered going to these different churches is that there is a difference when hospitality is a process and when hospitality is a process and part of the culture. And I want you guys to know of all the churches that we've been visiting, they've been awesome. You all have something very, very special here. All right. There is a culture of hospitality. A culture of a hospitality is an overflow of what the Lord is doing in your heart. You cannot be hospitable and love Jesus, or not love Jesus, excuse me, because to not be hospitable means your eyes are on yourself. Okay? To be hospitable means your eyes are off of you and onto others. This is a very, very hospitable church. And uh, I want to thank you for that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> All right, let's dive in. I got a timer. Is that my timer? Is that right there? That's my timer? Sure. I'll stick with it. See what happens. Pastor Jim and I were talking the other day uh, about being Gen Xers. Do I have any Gen Xers in the room? Let's go Gen X. Let's go. Best generation ever. Now, every generation has had their own special experiences, but us Gen Xers had a very unique experience when it came to being raised. Our childhood was a little bit different. We were lucky if in the summertime, uh, our parents remembered that we existed. Because we would wake up and fly out the door, and their last words to us would be, be back by dinner or be back before it's dark, right? And we'd be like, deuces out, right? Right? Our parents didn't raise us. No one raised us. 
people-wise, but we were raised by television. Television did raise us, right? I'm, I feel like I'm a combination, and some of you will know what I'm talking about. I'm like a combination of like uh, Growing Pains and Roseanne. You know, those two shows? I kind of, somewhere in the middle there is where Bill Tibbetts got reared into adulthood. Um, but as a child, I loved, loved shows like uh, Scooby-Doo. Did anyone else watch Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Machine, right? In every episode, there was a new villain. And, and then years later, you look back, you're like, I was an idiot to not realize that it was always going to be Mr. Smith, the pharmaceutical guy or the teacher. or It's, it's always the same script. But I love this idea of mystery and discovery. I, I love the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, right? I remember running down to the store and saving a dollar and ten cents so I could buy a new Hardy Boys book. And always being disappointed when they didn't have new ones. Who remembers? This is a good flashback. You ready? Okay, who remembers? I think his name was Robert Stack. Remember the show Unsolved Mysteries? Unsolved Mysteries. Why were we watching that as children? That alone is proof our parents were not paying attention to us. We should not have been watching. We should not have been watching that. But I did. And I loved the mystery. Now, for those of you who don't know what Unsolved Mysteries is, it's kind of like the 2020. Remember Dateline 2020 and Unsolved Crimes? That's what it was in the 80s. It was called Unsolved Mysteries. But knowing this, it was to no surprise to myself or my family that when I went to college, um, I studied to be a reporter, a journalist, because I wanted to discover uh, mysteries and solve them and, and bring resolve to questions that people had. In fact, I, I was from Cincinnati area, and, and our mayor uh, growing up was uh, Jerry Springer. You guys know who Jerry Springer is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry Springer was our mayor, but he got ousted from uh, his seat because uh, he had relationships with uh, a lady of the night, but paid her with a personal check, uh, and he got caught. But that was the kind of hard-hitting news I wanted to report on, all right? So I went to Purdue, and I took every opportunity I could to study and learn to be the best journalist I could be. I eventually had an opportunity with uh, a newspaper called the Cincinnati Enquirer, one of the largest newspapers uh, in the nation at the time, and was very, very excited because this was an opportunity for me to kind of fulfill a lifelong dream. But also, also, it was an opportunity for me to fulfill what my calling and belief was uh, for my role in the kingdom. And that was to get everybody saved <laughs> that I ever worked with, right? Whoever I worked with, I was determined. Cincinnati Enquirer, every single person was going to come to know the Lord, right? And we were going to change that newspaper around. We were going to be an ethical newspaper. But I really genuinely believed that. And I remember the day, the very first day of my job, I, I was walking. You had to kind of park at a, a kind of a parking garage, underground parking garage. And I come up and you turn the corner. And I remember looking at the Cincinnati Enquirer building. It was just this beautiful, ornate building. And I kind of had those kind of Clark, uh, Clark Kent feelings like I'm Superman. I'm, I'm like the Christian Superman going in here under disguise, right? I, hear, I also saw some snap snaps, right? You know, right? You know, like I'm going to go in, I'm going to testify, I'm going I'm I'm to be about Jesus, and, and I'm going to do this lifelong job. So I go in, and I remember what I wore that day. I wore a, a nice blue button-up shirt, and I had a brown, navy blue tie that had flowers on it, and which was really, really uh, pushing the, the fashion envelope in, in the mid-'90s. Uh, and I walk, and I got my ID, and I still, to this day, I have my Cincinnati Enquirer ID. Got there super early, and I walked up, and I got to my floor, and we opened the doors, and it was a sea of, uh, what do you call it? Cubicles. A sea of cubicles. Now, in 2024, we're all like, ugh, cubicles. 
No one wants to work at cubicles. But in the 80s and 90s, you were cool if you had a cubicle. Like, you talk about a corner office, you're like, yo, 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 my cubicle has eight foot walls. What does your cubicle have? You know, it was cool to be in a cubicle. And then uh, uh, in a newspaper, we call it the, the bullpen is what we call it. And so the bullpen, our cubicles were a little bit lower so you could sit and not be seen, but pretty easily look over uh, and, and talk to people. So I walk up and, and they, I know where my cubicle is and I, and I go to my cubicle and uh, man, this, this just lives so vividly <laughs> as if it just happened. So I go to my cubicle and right next to my cubicle, this, uh, I don't know. I mean, he probably was like six foot, but for some reason at that moment, it felt like he was like 6'10". Just a huge, giant man stands up and he's got a grizzly beard. Just a beard and his tie's already, it's seven o'clock in the morning, his tie's already half off and his sleeves are all already, no, I, I'll let you guess. What kind of reporter do you think he was? What did he report for? Sports. Yep, <laughs> he was one of the sports reporters. And he stands up and he goes up, he goes, hey, I'm Jim, what's your name? And he goes, and he goes, Bill, and he goes, nice to bleep meet you, Bill. And he just continues to talk and introduce himself. And I am not exaggerating when I say every third word was the most profound cuss word I have ever heard in my entire life. And you know in the movies when there's like a pause in the movie, like the person is having an out-of-body experience and all of life just pauses. That happened for me. It felt like a few minutes. It was probably maybe a second. But my young Christian ears did not understand what was happening in front of me. And, and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, what, what, what's up? What's up, Jim? <laughs> you know, and you, you get that posture going. And he goes on, and I got to be honest with you, years later, there's a little bit of, of me that respects him because he was basically a Shakespeare, the Shakespearean of cuss words. Just the things that he could put together, I was like, that's, I can't get offended by that. That's, that's just, he's brilliant, <laughs> you know? But I sat there and I'm like, I, oh, whew, whew, okay. Okay, okay, I can do this, I can do this, all right? So I'm sitting, and, and then the young lady who, uh, younger lady, who came in, she was in the cubicle over here. She came in a little bit later. She wasn't a reporter. She worked in ads, but she was kind of the bridge between reporters and ad sales. And so she had her cubicle in the, bin, uh, in the bullpen with us. And she comes in. Now, this is mid-90s, but she had the 80s the 80s vibe going on. So she had, she had some good old big old hair and tees and aqua net at that sucker out, you know, and she walks in and she greets her and I stand up and I go to meet her and her name was Janelle. Just one of the kindest people I've ever met. Um, and we're talking, we're talking. And at this point, it was my first opportunity to get a glance at her cubicle. And I look and all Janelle has pinned on the walls of her cubicle is what today we would call exotic art. Now, this is the mid-90s. Y'all, like, how did that happen? Well, this was the mid-90s. This is a whole nother world of what was accepted compared to today. But it was exotic art. And here I am shaking Janelle's hand, and I catch eye to it. I know I got as red as a balloon, and I started sweating like I am now. And I kept, I looked above her head for the rest of the conversation because I'm like, my eyes are not going down there. And then she proceeded to be comfortable enough to share with me that on the weekends, um, she was a special kind of dancer. And I'll just leave it at that. Again, with Jim, how can my young Christian ears <laughs> handle what I was hearing and with Janelle, how can my baby Christian eyes handle what I was seeing? And I go back to my cubicle, and I sat down, and I'll never forget, looking at the, the front of my cubicle, we had these giant computers, there was uh, the, the uh, extensions, everyone was, was pinned to the wall, and I remember looking right at the wall and saying, 
I don't know what it means to be a Christian in this moment. And that was hard because this was my dream forever. I didn't dream of anything else. And then two, I really felt like I was trained or told that my job as a marketplace Christian was to save everybody I came into contact with and make money and give it to people who do real ministry. You know? And I, I had a, there was a conflict happening right in real time for me. And I went through a process, and I'm going to walk you all through that process today. Is that okay? That took 12 minutes. Holy cow, I'm a storyteller. We're going to go fast. You ready? Okay, I'm a teacher, so we take notes. Take out, you got some to take notes with? Pens, phones, I don't care. If you're sitting there not taking notes, then you ain't paying attention. All right? Take notes. I, I think you got to take notes. I always do in church because I always feel like if the Lord's going to give you an ember, that ember dies out if you don't fan it right? So if the Lord's going to give you an ember today, let's take the notes and then fan that flame later on, right? Right? Okay, here we go. So I'm going to walk us quickly through three things that I went through. One, I had to kind of untangle what I call unintentional theology. I had to untangle, and I think we often pick up theology unintentionally. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, but I had to untangle it and then I had to reorientate, kind of rewire it, and then put things in motion. And that's what we're going to do today. My job is to demystify evangelism at the workplace. I want to demystify it. It's, it's not that hard, to be honest. And it feels hard. It feels sometimes bigger. Sometimes we're not even thinking about it. But I want to demystify it for you today. So, point number one. Ooh, look at my shiny forehead. I told you I'm fluffy, so you got to take around and after. Ah, much better. All right, here we go. Point number one, untangle. We do not save, God saves. Let me say that again. We do not save, God saves. So this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say who saves, and we're going to say God saves. Who saves? Nope, not all of you said it. I saw some mouths closed. Who saves? There you go. That was my point over here. Make sure everyone over here got it. Who saves? God saves. We do not save. That should take off a mantle of oppression immediately for some of us. That should take off a weight. We do not save. God saves. Now, it depends upon where we fall on what I call the Reformed versus Armenian spectrum. And all that means is kind of how we interpret Scripture. A theology, if you, if you have it. Does a sinner need to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit prior to conversion or not is the question that much smarter people, people than myself like to sit around tables and drink coffee and try to figure out. So to put it another way, how much of a person's decision for salvation is God working in their heart and how much is it a, person, a person's individual free will? Okay. Now, from a Reformed perspective, and all that means is just a way of looking at Scripture, okay? And full disclosure on this topic, uh, I am a believer in Reformed theology on this topic. If you disagree with me, um, I'll put Jim's uh, email address and cell phone up there later. Please feel free to reach out to him. Uh, <laughs> an individual cannot become a Christian without or before the Holy Spirit acts in their heart to turn them towards God. Let me say that again. An individual cannot become a Christian without or before the Holy Spirit acts in their heart to turn them towards God. Dot, dot, dot. That means you can pretty much approach anybody and everybody and assume that the Lord's working. Period. 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 You just have to believe. And that's why I sometimes have a struggle saying the lost, right? Lost people, because it doesn't speak to the journey that the Lord may have them on, right? Okay, now why I believe this is because in Scripture, Scripture was, when it was, it was very, it was an agricultural society. Therefore, a lot of examples in Scripture are based around growing things, and growing things are a process, right? We just don't get fruit. 
We have to plant a seed. We have to nurture that seed. That seed grows and that turns into a tree or something. And then we get fruit from it. There is a process. And I think Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit were intentional in using those examples. Because if this is the case, you ready for the next 30 plus days of political conversation on social media? We can't argue someone into the kingdom of God. If this is the case, we cannot argue someone into the kingdom of God. We cannot make someone believe. Instead, we can only show them who Jesus is, tell them about Jesus, and demonstrate his love towards them and trust that the Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of those whom God is speaking to. Okay? It's a very, very important part, uh, point to recognize we don't have to go save. God saves. We get to testify. Now, Paul is someone who wrote a lot of the New Testament. And this was a dude who was bad and became really good. And Paul, once he started following Jesus, he starts traveling around various countries and cities and so forth. And he starts planting churches. And one of the churches he planted was in Corinth. And Corinth was a huge city in Greece. And think of Corinth like New York City, okay? It was a city that had a lot of money, a lot of people, a lot of uh, movement and so forth. It was also a city known for a lot of debauchery and a city known uh, for a lot of idols and a lot of different religions, okay? It literally sounds like New York City, okay? Literally sounds like New York City. So Paul has left, and he is writing a letter to the church, the, the followers of Jesus in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians, all right? And I want to share with you, with that context, what he says. He says, I, Paul, planted the seed. Apollos watered it, came in after Paul to nurture the church and grow the church. But God has been making it grow. Who saves? One more time. Who saves? God saves. Because here, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will, be, uh, they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. We play a part but God saves, not us. My former boss, Bill Bright, uh, used to say, the definition of successful witnessing is to simply share Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Right? Okay. So if we don't save, but God does save, then what do we do? We are commanded to testify. We are commanded to testify, and that means by proclaiming and demonstrating. There should be a, 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 a thing under my, there we go. This is where I start to reorientate myself to the truth of scriptures. What is our job? Your job is simple. My job is simple. We just have to testify to the goodness of God. We get to testify to the gospel in our lives. That is it. God does the work. Holy Spirit moves. We don't have to save. We just get to live out our lives for Christ. Now, there's two important words here. One is proclamation and demonstration. To proclaim means to speak. And every generation has responded a little bit differently. I feel like the generation, my generation a little bit and generation above was all about proclamation, was all about uh, evangelism, uh, tent ministries and going out and, and just sharing the word with the world. And I love that. I love that. And then tail in my generation and others were like, yeah, but we also got to live it out as well. And we swung the pendulum all the way over, right? I feel like Gen Z is going to be the generation that gets it both. I think Gen Z is going to be the, I work with you guys, and I think you guys are going to be the ones that get it. So when we say proclaim, we mean speak the truth. You have to speak. Proclaim the word. Mark 16, 15. He said to them, go into all the world and what? 
preach the gospel to all creation. Go tell people about Christ. Go tell people about what God is doing in your life. Go tell people. 40% of the world still has not heard the name of Jesus. 40% of the world. Yet 98% of the world can tell you what the logo for Coca-Cola looks like. Right? We've got to go proclaim. We got to go testify. What does it mean to demonstrate? To demonstrate means we have to act it out. We have to live out the gospel in our lives. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What does that mean? It's really simple. Galatians 5, 22, 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We also have to live out the gospel in our lives. We have to proclaim and demonstrate the gospel. Mr. Rogers once said, there are three ways. It's never a good sermon unless Mr. Rogers is quoted. Mr. Rogers once said, there are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. And the third way is to be kind. All right? Let me show you why both of these are wildly important. We go to work, and I am living out the gospel by I am being kind, I am hardworking, uh, I do my work, uh, I serve people, I, 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 I'm living out, I'm demonstrating it. But I never proclaim the name of Jesus. That brand is a nice person. They're a nice person. Let's go to the other side. We go to work, and we're a total uh, tool bag, right? I literally just paused before something else fl flew out of my mouth. Haven't been here long enough to let that fly, all right? <laughs> Not cussing or anything, but just my own little vibrato. Uh, you go to work. You're the guy that blows up in meetings. You're late. You're not really nice. You're whatever. But you proclaim the name of Jesus. Oh, yeah. Jesus is good. Gee, we go to church on Sundays. That brand is hypocrite. All right? A lot of us fall, no, I shouldn't say this. A lot of uh, Christians typically fall on one side or the other, to be honest. To testify means to proclaim and demonstrate. You have to have both. You cannot just have one of those. We cannot have one of, just one of those. Uh, the go I love this quote. The gospel is hard to believe unless accompanied by acts of love. And love is incapable of transforming lives unless accompanied by truth. There needs to be more mm -hmm, Jesus to that. Let me do it one more time. The gospel is hard to believe unless accompanied by love. And love is incapable of transforming lives unless accompanied by truth. You have to declare and proclaim. We have to demonstrate and live out. All right? So who saves? Who saves? Okay, when I say what do we do, we say we testify. All right? Who saves? What do we do? We testify. That's it. God saves and we testify. There's your theology for marketplace evangelism, okay? All right, next point, and I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna go quick. I, this is a shout out to my son who likes to collect gaming systems. I call this set in motion PS4. This is the PS4 set in motion. How do we put all this in motion? Four things real quickly. Pray, proximity, service, and potency. Pray, proximity, serve, potency. I'm gonna go quick. I'm gonna assume you know you're the word, so I'm not going to fill this whole thing with scripture, but let's dive in. Pray first. This is not lip service. Prayer changes our perspective. Prayer keeps our head in the game. Prayer keeps us in a sovereign perspective. Who has ever experienced that when you go into a scenario and you didn't pray, you didn't cover it in prayer, versus when you go into a scenario and you've prayed for it? it feel, you've experienced that, right? I feel like an athlete. The difference between an athlete who's not ready versus whose head is in the game. 
when I've prayed, I think I, a lot of times we're like, well, I'm going to pray for, for, for my coworkers. And that. yeah, I also think prayer keeps us centered in the sovereignty of Christ. All right. Keeps us locked in. Prayer changes how we see ourselves and others. One of the things I encourage people to do is make a list of your coworkers and pray over them consistently. Jonathan Weibel said, he's, a, he's the man who led me to the Lord when I was 16. He said, talk to God about your neighbors. Talk to God about your coworkers before you talk to your coworkers about God. Let me say that again. Talk to God about your coworkers before you talk to your coworkers about God. Got it? All right. Uh, let's jump into proximity. Proximity is simple. It means we need to be in proximity to people. We've got to be in proximity with those who do not know the Lord. Uh, birds of a feather flock together. Have you heard that before? It just means we tend to surround ourselves with people who are like us. And I think that's this. This is our tribe. But then we got to go out. No one's going to get saved unless a follower of Christ is in proximity with them. <clears throat> no one's going to get saved unless a Christian is in proximity to them. So we got to go out. We've got to be with our coworkers. We've got to be with the lost. We've got to be with people who, are, who do not know the Lord. If being around the lost is difficult, then we need to go back to step one. Pray. Listen, if being in proximity is hard, if there's been moments that's hard for me, then I need to go step back and be, do step number one again. I need to pray again. I need to commit it to the Lord more. All right? Jesus hung out with sinners, and that did not affirm their sin. Read Luke 15. Jesus hung out with sinners, and he did not affirm their sin. He affirmed their soul. Okay? Service. If you don't know how to serve your coworkers, then you need to move back to proximity. <laughs> See how they build off of each other? Prayer leads to proximity. Proximity leads to service. If we don't know how to serve our coworkers, it means we haven't built enough relationship with them to know how they could be best served. Proximity leads to the ability to understand what their needs are. And there is no greater way to testify to the goodness of God than you humbling yourselves, me humbling myself, and serving someone. To extend my life, to go beyond margins at times, to serve someone. To help someone who's got a stack of spreadsheets that need child. To bring coffee for the receptionist who's having a hard and a personal relationship with her boyfriend. To, uh, I don't know, hanging out with people in the break room, right? I've, I've, I've led, uh, 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 I've, I've, been, I've had the privilege of sharing Jesus more with people in front of vending machines than any altar I've ever been at, okay? Proximity allows us to understand what it means to serve them. Uh, Henry Nowen said when, when he was asked about serving, he said, community is where humility and glory touch. Henry Nowen, kind of a, a famous priest, theologian, and so forth, said when he's talking about serving, he says, community is where humility, because you have to humble yourself to serve, all right, which only happens if you have proximity, is when humility and glory touch, because in that moment, the glory of God drops on you. I, I know it. I've done this a thousand times. I've seen others do it. I believe it. Last one. Potency is how strong something is, all right? How strong something is. Uh, kind of like when I smell my son's armpits after soccer. They're not atrocious, all right? But there's a little bit of potency, just a smidge, but it's, it's to be had, right? We all smell, buddy. It's okay. Um, when you walk through your work, do you smell like Jesus? Potency doesn't overflow. Have you guys seen those videos where they, uh, someone's doing an experiment and they pour something into this little tiny glass and it just explodes in this kind of foam-like stuff everywhere? That's how I want to be because I know Jesus. It overflows. Loving on others is overflowing. Amy Simple McPherson said, the greatest witness to the world is a spirit-filled life. 
We're at, we are not the light. We are only reflectors of the light. We are vessels that carry the light of Jesus. All right, very quickly, I'm 40 seconds over. Can I have five minutes? I'll wrap it up in five minutes, I promise. All right, so I've been preaching, teaching on this for about 30 years, and there's, uh, I'm gonna give you the three top questions I get asked from marketplace uh, uh, Christians, those in the marketplace, uh, after always uh, uh, preaching this. So first one, this is bonus question number one. How do I engage with bad behavior? I'm at work, and I've, I've got a Jim on this side and a Janelle on this side. How do I engage with bad behavior? What do I do when we're sitting in the break room? I worked in uh, international finance um, in early 2000s, and let me tell you, it's like Wolf of Wall Street, which I've never seen the movie. I don't recommend it, but I've heard, I've heard, I can testify that is exactly what it was like. It was, it was Sodom and Gomorrah. It was crazy, crazy. And you're sitting at a high top table in the break room and they're seeing things that are, it's just gross. I don't know how else to say it's just gross. And it's hard to hear how they would treat, uh, frankly, how they would treat women and the things that they talked about. Here's my answer. We got to care about the soul more than the sin. I think we get too caught up in the sin and feeling like we need to defend God. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to defend him. You don't have to. The work is done. We just need to testify. And in those moments, we've got to figure out how, how can I care about this person's soul? How can I care about Jim and Janelle's soul more than being so caught off by the sin that is around me? Okay? And you get better at it the more you practice, but then you can start saying things. Once you have proximity, then I would start saying things like, hey, uh, his name was Tim, but he, Tim, I'm very curious. I, what, what has happened in your life that has gotten you to this point where you're okay talking about women like that? I'm just, can you help me? I, I really want to understand. What, what, t- what is Tim going to respond to, that question? Or, hey, Tim, shut up. That, that's, that's bad. And, and, and there were times I would say that. Hey, you know me, buddy. You know I, I don't really want to hear this. But he much better responded to that first question because I cared about the soul more than the sin. Second one, what do I do when I mess up? What do I do when I'm the one that blew up at, at, at the meeting and I'm the one that's testifying to Christ. What happens when they know I'm the Christian, but I screwed up? Oh, it's easy. It's a great opportunity to testify about humility and redemption. I screwed up. I'm, I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I hope I can show you the same level of grace that you are showing me now. And honestly, the same grace I feel like I experienced in my personal relationship with God. Okay. Last question, when should I invite someone to church? Always get asked this question. When they've been invited to your table first. I'll say this again. Shouldn't I bring people to church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, please, I travel the world. And this is one of the very, very, very few churches that remind you that the church exists outside these four walls. Most churches build ministry as ministry exists in these four walls and primarily and only. This is one of the rare churches that gets it. No, ministry should actually primarily exist outside the four walls. You are the church. And subsequently, you don't need to bring people to church for them to hear the gospel or to be saved. They need to be invited to your table first. No one comes to church with our family unless they've been invited to our table first. Go out with your coworkers, build proximity, while you're praying for them and serve them. This is my last quote. Thank you for letting me, oh, five minutes exactly. In a polarizing world that is increasingly distanced from institutional Christianity, the future health and impact of the church hinges on how well we love our neighbors, how well we love our coworkers, how well we love our family. We, where we often viewed Sunday morning worship inside the walls of the Ford Church as the main location of God's activity, 
we now need to see our front yards, our homes, our workplaces, and our neighborhoods as outposts of the kingdom of God. Go forth and testify to the goodness of God in your life. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Your truth does not return void. You had us here today, Lord. We ask that you can give us the grace and mercy to fan the flame of the ember that uh, has been given to us today. All of us, Lord, we want to grow in this space. We want to be intentional. We want to be people who are looking to testify to your goodness, Lord, because we know that you're moving and we just want to come alongside what you're doing in people's lives, especially, especially our coworkers, Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for choosing us, for pulling the veil off of our eyes to see the goodness. We are here to testify of that goodness. In your name we pray, amen.